Hi there. Um, so welcome to 2.4 of Anatomy and Physiology for the Veterinary Technician Online Review Course. We are going to talk about, <clears throat> within this one PowerPoint, blood, lymph, in the lymphatic system and the immune system as well. Um, obviously during an immunology PowerPoint, we may cover more of the immune system, but as of right now, this will just be an introduction too. So um, let's start off with blood and how cool is this picture, right? It's like as if you're traveling through a vessel, it's so cool, great picture. So blood composition. Um, it's considered a fluid connective tissue, right? So we, we talked about different types of connective tissue and blood is one of them, which is strange because you think of connective tissue as being a solid mass, but um, this is actually a fluid connective tissue and it flows through the entire body. So when we're talking about whole blood, blood uh, we're referring to the blood that's contained in the cardiovascular system. So, um, and then there's also peripheral blood. And what we're talking about there is the whole blood circulating in the blood vessels. So um, carrying oxygen, nutrients, and waste materials. So when you're doing a cephalic venipuncture or a femoral or a saphenous venipuncture, even a jugular, you are collecting <clears throat> the peripheral blood, right? Just like in this picture here. So the functions of blood. <clears throat> The first function of blood is for transportation. So oxygen, which is carried by the hemoglobin, okay? And, and remember hemoglobin is the inside content of a red blood cell. So up here at the top corner, you can see this is a red blood cell and inside that there is like a goo and that goo is hemoglobin. And what hemoglobin is, is it's a protein composed of two components, which is heme and globin. And, um, and that's, wh that's what carries the oxygen. Um, it also transports nutrients. These nutrients dissolve in the plasma of the blood. It um, transports waste products. And we talked about this in past PowerPoints where cells use oxygen and nutrients for to, to, to create energy. And when they do create this energy, there is a waste product that is made. And, and that's, that's what's called cell metabolism. And the blood transports this waste material. Um, and we know the waste product that's produced is carbon dioxide, right? So carbon dioxide is the waste material that's picked up and in the blood that is sent back to the cardiovascular and the respiratory system to be expelled out of the body. Also transports hormones. We know that our endocrine system are ductless glands, so there's no ducts. It doesn't lead to one certain area. They're just glands and they um, excrete their hormones into the blood system and that's how they make their way to their tar to the target organs. The second function of blood is regulation. So what it regulates, it, it regulates d different things. It can regulate body temperature. So there's temperature regulators in the brain and um, that will help regulate the temperatures. Um, tissue fluid content, it helps the regulation of tissue fluid content. So it's kept as constant as possible. So whenever we're dehydrated, the plasma will actually leave our bloodstream and enter into our tissues to compensate for that dehydration. So that's really interesting. And, um, and, and that would explain why when you do a PCV and you have a really high red blood cell count because of a low, um, so you have very little plasma and a lot of red blood cells. And the reason why that happens in dehydration, it all makes sense now, right? Because the, the blood tries to help regulate that dehydration and how it does that is that it takes the plasma and it leaves out of the blood uh, into the tissues to compensate for that dehydration. So when we take our peripheral blood sample and spin down our PCV, we're gonna see very little plasma and that's because it's compensating for that dehydration. Um, and it regulates blood pH. We talked about this in, um, I do believe the very last PowerPoint, uh, normal blood pH roughly runs around 7.4 and it must be slightly alkaline to buffer the, the acidic waste from the cell metabolism. So the CO2 that's produced from cell metabolism is actually acidic and therefore our blood pH needs to be qu um, slightly alkaline to buffer that. And uh, in the last PowerPoint, we talked about that pH and the receptors in the medulla oblongata that, that um, measures that pH and then adjusts our respiratory, um, our respiration rate accordingly to compensate uh, for any kind of fluctuation in that 7.4 pH. And 
And um, <clears throat> the third is a defense system. So white blood cells are part of our blood, right? The white blood cells are floating in the blood and they are phagocytic cells. So they, um, they will eat and destroy any invaders that we don't want in our blood or in our system. And also platelets within our blood help with uh, def uh, help defend as a defense mechanism because of hemostasis, which just means like the process of clotting. So if we get a cut, our platelets will clot that so that we don't bleed out, right? So that's called hemostasis. So the composition of blood, um, there's a liquid portion and then a cellular portion. So the liquid portion is plasma. So we know that when we take a tube and we spin it down, what we get is plasma and that's the fluid that all these cells are floating in. And the cellular portion of that, there's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Red blood cells are termed as erythrocytes, white blood cells are termed leukocytes, and platelets are termed thrombocytes. And in this picture here, you can see the makeup of it. So um, interestingly enough, plasma is actually 91% water, which in that last PowerPoint, when we said that it helps with regulation of, um, of our fluid balance. So when we become dehydrated, remember we said that the plasma will leave our, our vessels and actually diffuse into our tissues to help compensate for that dehydration. And the reason why the plasma does that is because it's 91% water. So that's why it helps with that dehydration. And, um, and then you can see the platelets, the leukocytes and the erythrocytes. And those are all, you can see how they're all layered here. And this is how they, how they lie once they're spun down. You'll have your, your plasma on the top. You'll have a little thin layer of platelets and a thin layer of leukocytes. And these two together are called a buffy coat. And this buffy coat is, you can see it when you spin it down. It's a very thin layer and it almost has a whitish appearance to it. And then 45% um, of that sample, roughly, um, that's an average, will be erythrocytes. So again, this is a picture showing you a spun down sample. So we have 55% um, of our sample is roughly plasma. And then we have our buffy coat here, which is white blood cells and platelets, which make up less than 1%. And then 45% of it will be our red blood cells that are sitting down here at the bottom. So let's talk about plasma, the liquid portion of the blood. So 45% to 78% of the blood sample volume is, is made up of plasma, um, but it depends on the species of the animal and the size of its red blood cells. Um, very important, if you're, especially if you're working in small animal medicine, um, to know that, um, well, I guess this is more so during uh, when we start talking about erythrocytes, but uh, greyhounds will have a quite a higher uh, PCV uh, red blood cell percentage than your typical um, typical patient, canine patient, which is um, which w which is a great example of species variability. Um, so, 93% of it is water. Although I think on the last slide it said 91%. Either way, a huge amount of it, the majority of it, is water. Um, substances, so nutrients and waste dissolve or suspend in the plasma. So that's where you're going to find nutrients, nutrients and waste. It's within this plasma. Um, albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen are going to be found within this plasma. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen are going to be within this plasma, as well as lipids, amino acids, metabolic wastes, and electrolytes. Those are all within the plasma. So whenever we do any kind of uh, most of our blood testing in our clinics with our laboratory machines, it often requires plasma or serum, and that's why because there's so much that lies within that plasma and serum that's going to tell us um, how the body's functioning. So the cellular components, we just talked about the plasma being the liquid portion, the cellular components, we have our erythrocytes. So the erythrocytes carry oxygen. We, we know that. We, we mentioned that it's the hemoglobin portion of in, inside that red blood cell that will carry the oxygen. Um, it's about 65% water and 35% hemoglobin within that cell. It's round. It's anuclear. Um, it's an anuclear biconcave disc. So it doesn't have a nucleus unlike our white blood cells, um, and it's biconcave, so that means it's concave on both sides, just like you can see in this picture here, uh, and that's, that's typical for most mammals. There are variabilities. Thrombocytes, 
um, help prevent leaks from damaged blood vessels. So like I said, this is hemostasis. So when we're talking about leaks, we're talking about like hemorrhages, right? So thrombocytes are involved in uh, forming the clot to stop um, hemorrhage. And then lastly, our leukocytes. Our leukocytes, we talked about, there's five different types of leukocytes, and three of them are granulocytes, and two of them are agranulocytes, which means that they have no granules. And they have different functions depending on what, what blood cell we're talking about. So blood, blood, blood production, how is this blood made within our bodies? Um, the term that's used for the production of all of our, our blood cells is called hematopoiesis, and it occurs primarily in our red bone marrow. Remember we talked about red bone marrow being the inside content of long bones in a newborn um, animal most of the marrow is going to be red bone marrow. But as they start growing older, a lot of that red bone marrow will convert to yellow bone marrow, which um, is inactive and doesn't do anything, except for if that adult becomes anemic or there is a large demand for blood production, that yellow bone marrow can convert back to red bone marrow to help with hematopoiesis because only the red bone marrow can do the hematopoiesis the yellow bone marrow does nothing. Um, so again, fetal hematopoiesis occurs um, in the liver and in the spleen as well. So, so when we're talking about the fetus and during our skeletal system, we did talk about how that fetus doesn't necessarily, the, the bones don't ossify until its third trimester. So you can imagine that there's not going to be bone marrow within that fetus um, because most of their skeletal system is made up of cartilage all the way up into the third trimester of pregnancy where it'll start ossifying. Um, so the fetal hematopoiesis actually happens within the liver and the spleen. Neonatal, so um, when they're born, that's when it starts happening in the red bone marrow. All cells derived from one main cell, okay? So within this red bone marrow, every single cell that you'll find in blood is derived from one stem cell. So when you hear about stem cell therapy and stuff like that, that's why um, why it's so exciting because we can take these stem cells and develop them and mature them into different types of cells depending on what we want so you can alter it but it's the pluripo pluripotential stem cell is the name of the the one main cell that we'll have in our red bone marrow that will give birth if you will to all of the cells in the in the blood so this picture here is um, is a little bit blurry. I apologize, but this to, is to show you the pluri the pluripotential stem cell, which is this right here. And that pluri um, that stem cell will give birth, if you will. I say that, but it doesn't actually give birth. It it undergoes mitosis, but um, it will uh, give birth, let's say, to red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, as well as liver cells and nerve cells. So you can see that all these different things are all derived from one main mother of a cell and it's the pluripotential stem cell. So um, going back to um, hematopoiesis, there's different forms of hematopoiesis. So depending on what we're producing. So there's erythropoiesis, which is the production of red blood cell, red blood cells. There's thrombopoiesis, which is platelet production. And then there's leukopoiesis, which is white blood cell production. This shouldn't come to a surprise to anybody. And you guys should all understand this because we can see that the prefix here is erythro. We know that stands for white or red, sorry. Uh, thrombo stands for thrombocyte platelets, right? And then leuco, which stands for white. So we're referring to the white blood cell production. And then specifically with the white blood cell production, remember there's granulocytes and then there's agranulocytes. So when there's the production of the granulocytes specifically, it's called granulopoiesis, um, which will is the granulated white blood cell production. So this is just showing you every cell that we just talked about. Um, this is a beautiful slide. I, I, you'll never, this must have been, um, these cells, either this is digitally altered or these cells were placed within this field of view because you will never, um, <laughs> 
I've been doing this for a long time and never have I ever seen every single type of cell within one field of view. That's very, very rare. So, um, but nonetheless, you'll see your red blood cells are here. They have a little kind of clear center because remember they're biconcave. So they kind of kiss in the middle. So the hemoglobin's pushed around the edges there. Um, so you can see your erythrocytes here. You see the platelets, which are uh, very tiny and almost look like just like a little smudge. And then we have our lymphocyte and our monocyte, which are agranulocytes, so they do not have granules. So these are them here. And then our three granulocytes, which is our basophil, our neutrophil, and our eosinophil. Those are the three white blood cell granulocytes. And um, very cool picture here. So erythropoiesis. So this is uh, a form of hematopoiesis, but specifically erythropoiesis is the production of red blood cells. So from the stem cell that we were talking about to mature red blood cells, it takes actually one week in dogs. So so that's, that's quite impressive that uh, it takes one week for that dog for that stem cell to develop into a mature red blood cell that's ready to go out of the bone marrow and into the peripheral circulation and do its job. Um, it takes four days in cows and actually 36 hours in birds, which is quite amazing. Um, this rate of erythropoiesis is controlled by erythropoietin. Um, the erythropoietin is a hormone that's released from the cells in a kidney in response to hypo hypoxia. It triggers the stem cell to divide and differentiate. So we talked, we've talked a lot about this. Um, the kidney is actually responsible for producing this protein called erythropoietin, which stimulates erythropoiesis. Okay, so if in a state of hypoxia, so a low oxygen in the blood, the kidney will kickstart and start spitting out erythropoietin, and this will automatically cause erythropoiesis. So it's going to trigger that stem cell to start dividing and um, making itself into red blood cells to supply the blood with more red blood cells. Because obviously we're lacking red blood cells if we're hypoxic because the red blood cells are the cells that are carrying the oxygen. So if we don't have enough oxygen, therefore we can assume that there's not enough red blood cells carrying that oxygen. So this right here is um, is showing you from the stem cell all the way down to a mature red blood cell. Remember, all of these steps happen within one week. So it takes seven days for the initial to the left side here. You see the stem cell. And then uh, thanks to the, the erythropoietin dependent, it'll mitose or divide into these other cells, making their way down to a reticulocyte, which is an immature uh, red blood cell, down to an erythrocyte, which is a mature red blood cell. And those are the ones that are going to get spit out into the peripheral circulation. All of these from the stem cell all the way to the reticulate, reticulocyte sorry, is typically found within the bone marrow. Sometimes these guys will slip out if the bone marrow is trying to compensate for a lack of red blood cells in the peripheral um, vasculature, but um, typically right up to here it's in the bone marrow and the, these guys are the only ones that are found out in the peripheral um, vasculature. So red blood cell lifespan, so they only have a certain time to do their job and then after that it, they're done. So it varies within species. Uh, a red blood cell lifespan in a dog is actually 110 days. After that it's, it's done, it's gone. Um, cat is about 68 days. A horse and a sheep is 150 days. Cow being the most, which is 160 days. And mice is actually 20 to 30 days, so not very long at all. And this is a beautiful picture here showing a macrophage, which is um, a phagocytic cell that's responsible for getting rid of any um, invaders or any dead cells that um, are expired and need to go in the garbage. We'll have this macrophage, and this is a really, really cool picture of a macrophage that's getting rid of an old and dying red blood cell. So that was erythropoiesis. Let's talk about thrombopoiesis. So it's a type of hematopoiesis, but more specifically for thrombocytes, okay? So it's a production of platelets. 
Platelets are not a complete cell. Platelets are cytoplasmic fragments of bone marrow megakaryocytes. Now, a megakaryocyte is a large cell that's found in the bone marrow, and it's responsible for platelet production. So it's a very immature form of a platelet. And that megakaryocyte that's only found in the bone marrow, the cytoplasm is actually going to break off. And those little bits and pieces of cytoplasmic fragments is what makes its way into the peripheral nervous, uh, sorry, the peripheral vasculature. And they will that's what the the platelets will be and they are um, responsible for clotting so um, again this megakaryocyte um, undergoes incomplete mitosis during maturation the nuclei uh, nucleus divides and the cytoplasm doesn't so results in a multinucleated cell with abundant cytoplasm and you'll see a picture of this um, multinucleated divided mitotic megakaryocyte in the next uh, slide but the circulating platelets are round with numerous small purple granules and uh, they contain some clotting factors, uh, the granules do. And platelets remain in the peripheral blood until they are removed by tissue macrophages, so remember that's the phagocytic cell I was telling you about, because of old age or damage. So this right here is a picture showing you a megakaryocyte. So remember how we were saying that the megakaryocyte will go, will undergo mitosis. So that's splitting and dividing. So and and that only happens in the nucleus. So you can see there's a nucleus there, there's a nucleus there, so there's a nucleus. So it's multinucleated, which is not very typical for cells. But you'll see the megakaryocyte do this in a bone marrow. And look at all that that cytoplasm. There's going to be little bits and pieces of the cytoplasm that's going to break off and find its way into the peripheral blood, and that's what makes up platelet. And this is a peripheral blood sample that you see. This, this big cell here is a red blood cell. And all these little tiny smudges here are bits of this cytoplasm, which are actually the platelets in the peripheral blood. So that's erythropoiesis. We talked about thrombopoiesis. This is the last type of hemato hematopoiesis, and it's leukopoiesis. So it's specifically the production of white blood cells. This also occurs in the red bone marrow. Uh, some lymphocytes develop further outside of the bone marrow, so they'll be made by the bone marrow, but then will develop um, outside the bone marrow further. Um, it comes from the same pluripotent stem cell that produces red blood cells and megakaryocytes. So remember, they all come from that one stem cell. Each type of white blood cell has its own stimulus for production, okay, because there's five different types of white blood cells. Three of them are granulocytes and have a slightly different path of production than the other type of two gra eight granulocytes. And again, remember the production of granulocytes specifically is called granulopoiesis. So this right here is showing you um, leukopoiesis. So you can see here, this, these three here are the granulocytes. And so their path of production is quite different than these two um, A granulocytes. So these three granulocytes all come from a promyelocyte, and then they will differentiate into an eosinophilic myelocyte, neutrophilic and basophilic myelocyte, which will then mature again into um, eventually the mature basophil, neutrophil, and eosinophil, which is the granulocytes. And then we have our monocyte, um, and our lymphocyte that it comes from a pro-lymphocyte or a pro-monocyte. So anything that you see here in the blue, all of this typically happens uh, within the um, within the bone marrow. Again, just like in the red blood, red blood cells, if there is a deficiency in the blood and the bone marrow actually starts spitting them out, or I shouldn't even just say deficiency, but maybe a higher demand for, the bone marrow may start spitting them out a little bit early and you can potentially the band neutrophils right here are often seen when there is a high demand of white blood cells and the bone marrow will start spitting them out a little bit early but before they're actually fully mature and we call these band cells and these this one right here is typically the one that we'll see when we have that um, early spitting out of the bone marrow but typically everything in the blue happens in the blown ma bone marrow and then everything down here is going to be found in the peripheral blood So here's a picture of the five types of white blood cells. Um, a, we have the neutrophil, and we're going to go through each one of these cells and talk about um, what they do and what they look like. But we have our neutrophil here. Um, so you can see all, all, all the white blood cells are 
pretty similar in size. The last one here, the E, is a monocyte and it tends to be a little bit larger. And our lymphocyte, which is D, it can um, sometimes be a little bit smaller, but they're all about the same size, typically always larger than a red blood cell. So the first one, A, is a neutrophil, which is our first granulocyte. Sometimes the granules are a little bit tricky to see in that neutrophil, but then we have our eosinophil, which looks like a neutrophil, except for it has very pink granules and they're very visible. And then C, we have our last type of granulocyte, which is a basophil with very dark purple granules and much larger granules than the eosinophil and um, very visible. And then we have our A granulocytes, which is D lymphocyte and E monocyte, which are very um, easily distinguished apart from the granulocytes because their nucleus is quite shaped differently. The granulocytes nucleus, they're usually lobed or segmented, whereas the A granulocyte, the lymphocyte has a, usually a very round circular um, nucleus and the monocyte has a very large blob like nucleus. So um, granulopoiesis specifically, so the production of our granulocytes, which is the neutrophils, eosinophil, and um, basophil. Initially, there's no cytoplasmic granules then nonspecific granules are formed. So initially in the immature early stages, you're not going to see those granules. Specific granules are produced during maturation, so granules contain different substances depending on the cell's function. So whatever the neutrophil does, whatever the eosinophil does, and whatever the basophil does, those granules are going to serve a specific function for what they do. For example, a neutrophil's granules contains lysosomal enzymes, and because neutrophils can be phagocytic, so um, they will have have those lysosomal enzymes to help with the phagocytosis. So let's start talking about all five of these white blood cells. The first one we're going to talk about is the neutrophil. Um, this is the most common white blood cell seen in the peripheral blood. Um, so it is a granulocyte. It has a segmented nucleus, like I had mentioned before. Sometimes people say it's lobed or segmented. So the mature neutrophil in circulation has two to five nuclear segments, so two to five lobes, and typically they're joined by a little strand of chromatin. So you can see that they're kind of um, touched together by a little strand. Um, like I said, the neutrophil is the most numerous white blood cell in circulation in the dog, horse, and cat, and it usually accounts for 40 to 75% of the circulating white blood cells. So when you do a white blood cell count, it's more so closer to the 75%. Um, so the 75% of those white blood cells that you count will be neutrophils, so they're the most commonly seen. Sometimes the granules are hard to see, but they're there, and uh, the neutrophils function is for, uh, they what they do is phagocytosis. So like I said, the granules contain lysosomes uh, capable of destroying bacteria and viruses that have been engulfed. So um, the, the neutrophil will phagocytize those bacteria and viruses. And... Um, Neutrophils, surprisingly enough, are only in the peripheral circulation for about 10 hours, and then they're done. Once the neutrophil enters the tissue to do its job, it does not return into the circulation. So um, whatever the, the neutrophil's job is to do, it will, it will diffuse from the blood circulation into the tissue where it has to do its job, and it will never return. So amazingly enough, it's replaced about 2.5 times a day, our neutrophils, um, and replaced by mature neutrophils held and reserved in the bone marrow. So the bone marrow will hold on to those mature neutrophils and spit them out um, when needed. If a neutrophil is released by the bone marrow too early, like I said, when we were talking about, um, you know, how it forms from the stem cell all the way down into an immature neutrophil, and then the most mature is what gets spit out to the peripheral blood system. But if our body is um, under a high demand of white blood cells because of infection or whatever, the bone marrow may start spitting out these immature neutrophils because perhaps they've used up all their mature neutrophils that they have in storage and they still need to push out more so they'll start pushing out immature ones. So what happens there is the nuc and they're very easily distinguishable from a mature um, typical neutrophil because their nucleus is not going to be lobed or segmented. It actually takes on a horseshoe shape and these are actually called band cells. So these are seen on the peripheral but if these are seen in a peripheral blood smear, it means that there's an increased demand for neutrophils. And, um, you know, again, depending on, it could be due to an infection or something like that. So, um, 
And this condition is called a left shift. So if ever you hear of a patient that has a left shift, that's what they mean, is that there is banned neutrophils in the peripheral blood smear that you're looking at. And that's atypical, that shouldn't happen and needs to be noted and, needs, and the doctor needs to know that because that is a left shift. So there's immature neutrophils being spit out by the bone marrow. This picture right here shows you typical, normal neutrophils. So actually, I would actually, I would probably say that these are a little bit atypical because they seem to have more segments or lobes than, than, than they typically would. For example, here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven lobes, which is, which is quite a bit uh, of segments. And so we would actually call this, I would, if I were doing this blood smear, I would make a notation that my neutrophils are hyper segmented. So they actually have more segments than usual. This looks a little more typical. You can see it has four segments or four lobes here, and that's pretty typical. But again, this one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine segments, and, that, and that's absolutely a hypersegmentation, which is atypical and should be noted. Um, but uh, the, this is what a neutro mature neutrophil looks like. And you can see the granules very nicely within these, these white blood cells. And if we were to look at the rest of the slide, these are all red blood cells here. And these little smears, smudges here, these are all platelets. And there's another platelet up here. Now this is an excellent slide because we talked about mature neutrophils and then we talked about that left shift, which means that a bone marrow is spitting out immature neutrophils because there's a high demand for those neutrophils. And um, so these uh, immature white blood cells or these immature neutrophils don't have the segmentation in their nucleus like a typical mature neutrophil will have. They'll have a horseshoe shaped neutrophil just like right here. So it takes on this horseshoe shape and this is called a band cell. It's still a neutrophil, it's an immature neutrophil, but we call it a band cell. So when doing your differential count, if you come across this, I would still um, I would still count it as a neutrophil, but make another count for band cells. So if you, for example, come up with 90% neutrophils within your 100 uh, differential count, but uh, you can say that perhaps 40 of those 90 were actually banned cells. And that's very important for diagnostic reasons to, to mention to the doctor. So the second type of white blood cells, so the second type of granulocyte <coughs> is the, the eosinophil. It has red granules in the cytoplasm and it's not commonly seen, so zero to 5% of the total white blood cell count, whereas remember the neutrophil was like 75% of them. So sometimes you'll do a differential count and you won't even see any of these eosinophils. It's produced in the bone marrow from the same pluripotent stem cell that gives rise to all other blood cells. We, we know that. Um, it has a segmented nucleus, just like the neutrophil. It usually has two lobes, but remember that neutrophil, it wasn't abnormal for them to go up to like four or five lobes. So maybe less lobes, but typically they have a segmented nucleus, just like the neutrophil. Its function is anti-inflammatory. So the granules, remember the granules within these granulocytes all serve a specific function. And in the eosinophil, the granule contains anti-inflammatory substances. So during um, cases of inflammation, you may find eosinophils present there. It helps with immunity, so it can ingest substances associated with the humoral immune response. We talked about the humoral immune response during um, immunology. And um, phagocy phagocytosis, so minimal, it has minimal phagocytotic um, function and bactericidal functions, usually large organisms such as protozoans and some parasitic worms. And that's why you're going to see eosinophils during parasitic infestations. You may see an increase in those eosinophils because they do play a role in um, phagocytosis with these parasitic worms. This here, although it's blurry, it was hard to find a picture to show in comparison. The one to the left here, that is a neutrophil. So you can see the lobed, 
uh, nucleus or the segmented nucleus. You can't really see the granules in this uh, neutrophil, but again, um, that's that's not abnormal. And then we have right here our eosinophil. So it, it, it is segmented. It looks like there's two segments here. And those granules are very, very obvious and take on a pink appearance. And, um, and this is their sizes compared to just one riblet cell right here. So the third type of granulocyte and the last type of granulocyte that we have to talk about is the basophil. So these guys have blue granules in the cytoplasm. Remember B, basophil is B for blue. I still, after years of practicing and after thousands of differentials, sometimes I still have a hard time remembering which one, like if an eosinophil, differentiating between an eosinophil and a basophil. But a good trick is B for basophil means B for blue. So the granules are going to take on a blue purple kind of appearance as opposed to a pinkish reddish, which is the eosinophil. Um, not always visible on stain, so it can be tricky, um, but typically they are and they, it, those granules may completely fill in the entire cytoplasm. It's at least often seen in white blood cell circulation, so even less likely than the eosinophil. Dogs have fewer granules than other common domestic species, so it may not be as granulated as other species. Nucleus usually has two to three lobes, similar to the eosinophil and the neutrophil. And what do they do? So the basophil, the granules within the basophil, they contain histamine and heparin. So the histamine helps initiate inflammation and acute allergic reactions. So if you have an allergic dog and you're doing a differential on that dog that has chronic allergies, you are most likely gonna be able to see these basophils. And uh, the heparin, contained in these granules acts as a localized anticoagulant to keep blood flowing to ensure, uh, to an injured or damaged area. Um, so that's how the heparin within these granules will help. Um, eosinophils are attached, or sorry, are attracted to the site of an allergic reaction by chemo, uh, chemotactic factors released by the basophil granules. So the basophil granules will release a factor, um, a certain chemical that will then draw the eosinophil to that allergic area. This here is showing you a picture of a basophil versus an eosinophil. To the left, we have our basophil. B for basophil is B for blue granules. So these granules, typically, they, they look more purple than blue, but um, purplish blue. And then over to your right, you'll have your eosinophil, which has smaller pink to, um, pink to red kind of granules. So the fourth type of white blood cell, now we're done with our granulocytes, so these last two white blood cells are agranulocytes, which means they do not have any granules. The monocyte is, makes up of 5 to 6% of all circulating white blood cells in, the, in, in common domestic species. So remember, our neutrophils make up about 75% of them, about 5, per six, 5 to 6% of these white blood cells circulating is going to be monocytes. It's the largest white blood cell in circulation. It's abundant cytoplasm stains blue or gray. And within the cytoplasm, you may actually see vacuoles. So it almost looks like air bubbles. So vacuoles within the cytoplasm, it's very, it's very normal to see those vacuoles within the cytoplasm of a monocyte. And their nucleus is pleomorphic. So it means that it has a, a variable nucleus size and shape and it's non-segmented. So it doesn't take on the segmentation of the granulocytes. It actually um, just has a variability in size. And I usually refer to the monocyte um, nucleus as it looks like a blob, like it just kind of, someone just threw it in there and just blobbed down like a big blob. And you'll see what I mean on the next picture. Um, so I guess the picture of the monocyte will be on the next slide, assumingly. Uh, the function of the monocyte, it's a, it's a very important phagocytic cell, okay? So it ingests foreign substances. Function in circulating blood to phagocytize damaged blood cells or microorganisms found in the blood, okay? So when the monocyte is in the circulating blood in your veins or in your arteries, they phagocytized damaged blood cells Okay, so remember that picture of that red blood cell that was dead and dying and it needed to go and it was getting eaten by that macrophage? Um, well, the monocyte, okay, actually plays a role in that and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and also involved in uh, microorganisms found in the blood, they will um, phagocytize that as well. So 
when these monocytes transfer into tissue, they actually are known as tissue macrophages. Okay, so when they do transfer over, they turn into macrophages. They're found in organs that remove or contain foreign invaders, um, damaged old blood cells and cellular debris. So like the liver, the spleen, the lymph and the lymph nodes, you're gonna find a lot of these macrophages because a lot of these invaders will go to these areas and the macrophages will then take care of them by phagocytizing them. They actually, um, they also follow neutrophils into tissues in response to tissue damage caused by trauma or invading microorganisms. So don't forget those neutrophils will also transfer over to tissues. And remember, we talked about that when we were saying that the neutrophil, once it does um, transfer over to tissue, it doesn't go back into circulation. So that's the end of its life once it goes into a tissue to do its job. And the macrophages, or sorry, the monocytes usually will follow those neutrophils to help phagocytize um, invader, invaders in that traumatized area. Um, they remain at the site of damage longer than neutrophils, so they have a longer lifespan. They remove cellular debris that remains after an inflammation and or an infection clears up. So they kind of clean up the mess after the inflammation or infection is gone. The, the, mono, uh, the macrophages or the monocytes will still be there cleaning up the mess. Um, process certain antigens, making them more antigenic. So present antigens to, they present, sorry, um, they present antigens to lymphocytes as a part of, a, of an immune response. So these monocytes play a role within that uh, antigen and antibody response. This is the picture right here of a monocyte. Um, you can see the arrows are pointing to a much larger cell than the white blood cell down here, which is our neutrophil. This is a very beautiful, normal looking, mature neutrophil. It has the segmented lobe nucleus, and this is little strands of chromatin that we were talking about that it's connected together. Um, you can't really see the granules here in the cytoplasm in this neutrophil, but that's not abnormal. And the monocyte is, is quite larger than that neutrophil. These are the vacuoles that I was telling you about. These They look like there's little air bubbles within the cytoplasm and those are called vacuoles and this is the the weird nucleus it's not it's not lobed like our new, our neutrophil it just takes on this big blob of an appearance and that's a monocyte and the very last white blood cell that we are to discuss is the lymphocyte. So the lymphocyte is the last agranulocyte. So remember, um, there's two agranulocytes, the monocyte that we just talked about, and then the lymphocyte. So primary, this is the primary circulating white blood cell in ruminant and pigs. Okay, so in, um, in our typical monogastric dog, cat, human, this is not the primarily the primary circulating white, white blood cell because we know those are the neutrophils, but in ruminants and pigs, the lymphocyte is the most predominant. Um, in your um, monogastrics and dogs and cats and humans, I would probably say similar to the monocyte, which makes up for, I do believe the monocyte was, what was it, like a 5%, 0 to 5 maybe, or was that the eosinophil? Either way, um, it does it does not make up a large percentage. I would probably say five to 10% of the circulating blood would be a lymphocyte. It has no phagocytic capabilities. The, the neutrophil um, and the monocyte had phagocytic capabilities. The lymphocyte doesn't. Most reside, most of the lymphocyte reside in lymphoid tissue and, the, and circulate between the tissues and blood. The nucleus of this lymphocyte is round and, or oval, and it's not segmented, so it's very easy to distinguish the lymphocyte from all the other white blood cells because it almost looks like an eyeball. It has a very round nucleus. And this here is showing you uh, lymphocyte and the very round nucleus. It has an, a high NC ratio, so a high nucleus to cytoplasm ratio. And um, so that means, um, there's very little cytoplasm here and the nucleus takes up most of the space within the cell. So a high NC ratio and it looks like an eyeball, right? And that's our, that's our lymphocyte. So the lymphocyte, every lymphocyte has a surface marker that differentiates subsets of each type of lymphocyte. 
okay? So there's different types of lymphocytes, and this is where lymphocytes can start getting a little bit confusing. And the markers on these lymphocytes, you can't see them when you're looking under the microscope, microscope doing um, your differential. You don't see them. Um, but there's three different types of lymphocytes. And um, there's going to be surface markers on these lymphocytes that are going to differentiate all three of these lymphocytes. Again, you can't see that on your typical light microscope. You have uh, T lymphocytes, which are referred to as T cells. Uh, you have B lymphocytes, which are referred to as B cells. And then you have your natural killers, or NK cells. Both the T cells and the B cells can become memory cells. So that means clones of the original lymphocytes are made um, so how can I explain this? So T cells and B cells, once they respond to a certain antigen, so in a certain pathogen, the lymphocyte reacts to that because it's a part of the immune system and the immune response, and um, they'll actually clone themselves or duplicate and make a, an identical twin to themselves. And they'll, they'll become a memory cell. And that memory cell means that the next time that that pathogen or that antigen comes into that animal, that memory cell is going to say, wait a minute, I've dealt with you before. I know how to kill you. And it'll get rid of it before the animal actually develops clinical signs. So the body's able to fight it off quicker. Um, the, um, the T cells and the B cells reside in lymphoid tissue until the second exposure um, of the same, oh sorry, the memory cells reside in the lymphoid tissue until second exposure to the same antigen encountered previously. And it'll give a quicker and mounts a greater response than the initial immune response. So those memory cells are really good to have. So once you're exposed to one virus or one pathogen or one antigen, your body typically will be able to fight that exact same pathogen off thanks to these memory cells that are just hanging out in the lymphoid tissue just waiting to bump into that antigen again. So T lymphocytes, um, they're, processed, they're processed in the thymus before going out to peripheral lymphoid tissue. So um, the pre-T cells in the thymus are actually called thymocytes. And they're responsible, these T lymphocytes are responsible for cell-mediated immunity. So that means no antibody production is involved. And they also activate the B cells. So most of the lymphocytes in the peripheral blood are T cells. So when you're doing your peripheral uh, white blood cell count, you see those lymphocytes. Typically, those will be your T lymphocytes that you're actually seeing. And they're involved in cell-mediated immunity. Our B lymphocytes, um, inactive B cells travel through lymph nodes, the spleen, and other lymphoid structures. They're rarely in the peripheral blood. Um, they're responsible for humoral immunity. So this is an immunity um, where antibody production is involved. Each B cell is pre-programmed to produce one specific antibody type against one specific antigen. So that's quite impressive. When B cells recognize an antigen, they actually turn into a plasma cell and then start releasing antibodies. And then the last type of lymphocyte we have here are natural killer cells. Um, they're found in the blood as well as in the lymph. The natural killer cells don't have to be activated by any specific antigen. And they are cytotoxic, so they will kill these cells, hence the name natural killer, I'm sure. They have the ability to kill some types of tumor cells and cells infected with various um, viruses. And um, most come in direct contact with these cells before they can destroy them. Or sorry, they must come into direct contact with these cells before they can destroy them. So if a natural killer cell is going to be killing a certain type of tumor cell, it must come in contact with it. So now that we discussed uh, the blood and everything and all of its components, let's talk about the lymphatic system. This is a really impressive picture showing you the lymphatic system and how it goes through the whole entire body, similar to the circulatory system. And, um, and you can see the lymph nodes there. And a lot of these lymph nodes are actually quite superficial that you can palpate them. Uh, we talked about being able to palpate the submandibular lymph node, which is right underneath that jaw there. And you can just squeeze 
place that on an animal and feel it. You can typically feel the cervical lymph node, the, the auxiliary lymph node, the inguinal lymph node, and the popliteal, which is also very easily palpated in animals. Um, so these are very superficial lymph nodes that we can actually feel, but uh, don't be fooled. There are lymph nodes, hundreds of lymph nodes, maybe thousands of them throughout the whole entire body, and they're throughout this whole lymphatic system that you see here. So this, the lymphatic system itself is a series of vessels and ducts, so similar to the circulatory system. They carry access interstitial fluid to blood vessels near the heart where this fluid is put back into the bloodstream, okay? So they control the interstitial um, tissue fluid and they will bring it back towards the heart so that it can go through circulation. Um, it includes lymph tissue scattered throughout the body so lymph nodes, spleen, thymus, tonsils, and something called gut-associated lymph tissue. And these are all different types of lymph tissue that are scattered throughout the whole system. Um, lymph, so this is the um, actual liquid part of our lymphatic system, is composed of blood cells and mostly lymphocytes. It's made up of nutrients, so proteins and fats, and also hormones. Some T cells circulate from the blood to the interstitial fluid to the lymph back to the blood again. Remember in our circulating peripheral blood, we'll most likely see those T cells, those T lymphocytes. Um, B cells are found primarily in the lymph tissue and very recirculate. So remember we did mention that those T cells are often found in the peripheral system circulating in blood and the B cells are typically in the lymphatic system. So lymph formation. Access interstitial tissue um, picked up by small lymph capillaries. I think that's supposed to say access interstitial tissue fluid picked up by small lymph capillaries that start blindly in the interstitial space of soft tissues. Fluid enters and leaves the tissue space based on blood pressure and osmotic pressure. Okay, so you can see here is our circulatory system. We have our arterial going down into our capillaries and then moving into our venous um, circulatory system. Our lymphatic capillary will come right there and actually um, with thanks to um, blood pressure and osmotic pressure pressure fluid can enter and leave the blood system and make its way into the lymphatic system or vice versa. Um, lymph capillaries join together to form a larger and larger lymph vessel. Many contained one-way valves that prevent lymph from flowing backwards. And remember, um, that, that should kind of um, remind you of something and specifically those one-way valves in our veins that allow the blood in our vein to just move towards the heart and not backflow. Well, the lymphatic circula circulation has a similar system. Body movements actually propels the lymph towards the heart. So, it, so thanks to our movement of our body, it helps bring that lymph towards the heart. Lymph vessels eventually join to form the thoracic duct, and this thoracic, thoracic dump, duct empties lymph into the vena cava just before it enters the heart. Lymph vessels pass through at least one lymph node and pick up lymphocytes. Any microorganisms in the lymph are removed by macrophages that are found in those lymph nodes. This here is a diagram showing you the lymph circulation. And you can see it has, um, you obviously, um, they kind of go hand, it kind of goes hand in hand with our blood circulatory system. And um, so here's the heart and the arterial blood leaving the arteries. And then they go down into the capillaries where nutrient absorption and waste materials picked up and all that happens. And then goes into the venous system. Well, right at this capillary section, we're gonna have the lymphatic capillaries that are gonna be working together with those capillaries and um, and helping with uh, diffusion of materials and then um, the lymph will make its way up the lymphatic system and then dump itself into right here which is the vena cava which will go into the circulatory system so lymph characteristics uh, it's transparent or a translucent liquid containing various um, number of cells primarily lymphocytes um, more sugar, water, and electrolytes than plasma has. Fewer of the larger proteins found in plasma. And uh, chyle, 
which is slim from the digestive system. Um, we, when we talk about the digestive system, we say that chyle is formed in the small intestine, and, um, and this is lymph from the digestive system, chyle. So what's the whole point of the lymphatic system? Basically, it, rem it removes access tissue fluid. So if ever you have edema in uh, some kind of tissue of a patient, the lymphatic system is what's going to carry that excess fluid back to the heart. And then the heart will um, recirculate that fluid and chances are sent it to the kidneys to get peed out. Um, waste material transport. So interstitial fluid contains uh, some of the waste materials from tissue cell metabolism. So we'll find that being transported in the lymphatic system as well. Filtration of lymph. So removal of microorganisms, cellular debris, and other foreign materials. We mentioned that that happens within the lymph node, thanks to macrophages that are just in there waiting to do their job, and also helps transport proteins. So we're going to talk about lymphoid organs and tissues, and the first one we're going to talk about is the lymph node themselves. Lymph nodes are small kidney bean-shaped structures located in various points along the lymph vessels. So like I said at the beginning, um, it can be superficial or it can be deep. The lymph nodes are divided into a cortex and a medulla. Now remember, um, the kidney is also divided into a cortex and a medulla, and also the adrenal gland is also separated into a cortex and a medulla, and they all happen to be kidney bean shaped structures, which is pretty amazing. So I wonder what the correlation is there with kidney bean shaped structures and why they have a cortex and a medulla. Either way, the cortex of the lymph node specifically um, is the where the lymphocytes live, and then the medulla is where the macrophages are embedded and uh, they hang out there waiting to phagocytize all the invaders. This right here is showing you um, the medulla of the lymph node and the cortex. So you can see over here we have our cortex and that's where most of the lymph lymphocytes are hanging out. And then we have our medulla right here where most of the macrophages are hanging out. The next lymphoid organ or tissue that we're going to talk about is the spleen. So the spleen is a tongue-shaped organ located on the left side of the abdomen. You can see it in this picture of the dog right here. Um, it's near the stomach uh, in monogastric animals and near the rumen in ruminants. And it is the largest lymphoid organ in the body. The spleen, um, it stores red blood cells. It produces red blood cells for the fetus. Remember, because the bone marrow doesn't produce red blood cells for a fetus, it's the spleen that does that. And it also filters blood and lymph. It is not essential for life, so it can be removed when we do a splenectomy, right? We can do that and it's not essential for life. The immune system would still be active because of the functions of, uh, there's other lymphoid organs that'll do the job just fine. It's not necessary to have the spleen there. Um, another type of uh, organ or tissue in, involved in the lymphatic system is the thymus. The, the lymphoid organ located in the, uh, this lymphoid organ is located in the caudal neck and cranial thoracic region on other so, uh, either side of the trachea and you can see it listed in this picture over here to your right. It's much larger in young animals. Um, because the immune system is not fully developed in young animals, so they really rely on this thymus to help them out with their immunity. But it shrinks and turns to fat in mature animals. So as um, in that mature animal, the thymus will actually be completely obsolete, so it won't be doing anything, but uh, very important in the younger animals. And um, the thymus produces T cells. The tonsils, um, another type of lymphoid organ. Um, they're nodules of peripheral lymphoid tissue, and you can see it in the picture over here to your right. It's found close to the mucosal surface all over the body. Um, the pharynx, the larynx, the intestines, the prepuce, and the, vagi the vagina. So you can actually, it's, it's very strange. Typically when we talk about tonsils, we're only referring to the one in the throat, but there's actually several found all throughout the body. So um, tonsils in the pharyngeal region, like this picture over here, prevents the spread of infection into the respiratory or digestive system. And um, it's located at the beginning of the lymph drainage system, not along the lymph vessels. 
Okay, so we talked about the blood and its components. We talked about the lymphatic system, and now we're going to do kind of like an introduction into the immune system. So the actions of the immune system, phagocytosis and destruction of foreign cells. That is the whole purpose of our immune system. Lysis of foreign cell membranes. So lysis means to rupture. Inactivation of pathogenic organisms or chemical substances. And um, the immune system is actually divided into two different categories. It's divided into innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity is a rapid, non-specific, and destroys non-self invaders indiscriminately. Indiscriminately, that's a hard word to say. Um, so it doesn't target specific organisms. It'll destroy anything that's foreign. Absolutely anything that's foreign, it'll just kill it. Okay, so it, it doesn't discriminate. If you're not meant to be in here, I'm going to kill you. That's the way they work. That's the way the innate immunity works. So it's present at birth and uses various components to protect the body. So for example, mechanical barriers, the skin and the um, mucous membrane, okay, will we'll do that mechanical barrier protection. Chemical barriers, so for example, hydrochloric acid in the gastric mucosa, um, the inflammatory and inflammatory response. So tissue damage provokes a release of chemical me, uh, mediators. So, um, for example, histamines and other chemotactic factors. And uh, phagocytosis by neutrophils, monocytes, and tissue macrophages is a part of this innate immunity. And then we have adaptive immunity. Um, the adaptive immunity targets a specific organism, but it is slower to respond to the invader. So it's not present at birth, but develops as the animal matures and it's exposed to various antigens. So exposure to antigens, the adaptive immunity uses the antibodies, memory cells, plasma cells, and B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes to provide immunity. So the immune system, um, all of these factors, which we've all, which, which, which we've talked about in these past slides, all of these cells play a role in adaptive immunity. And of course, the subcategory to the subcategory, there's two types of adaptive immunity. You can have humoral immunity or cell-mediated immu um, um, immunity. So humoral immunity is triggered by extracellular pathogens and result in antibody production. So the antibodies produced by the B cells and the plasma cells, um, and they target a specific antigen. When the B cells and the antigen bind, they wait for the T cell to initiate immune response. B cells then make a copy of itself. Remember, it's that cloning process. And they develop into a plasma cell that will produce antibodies for that unique antigen. And another word for antibody is an immunoglobulin. And we talk about immunoglobulins a lot in um, immunology and immunoglobulin is just a fancy word for antibody. There's different types of immunoglobulins um, and, and keep in mind these are antibodies. They're Y-shaped proteins that um, are used to neutralize bacteria and viruses. That's what an antibody is. There's IgG, Okay, so antibody G, first um, antibody made during the first exposure to an antigen. So that's what IgG is, is that first antibody. IgM is made when an animal is exposed to an antigen for a long time or when it's exposed to an antigen for the second time. IgA uh, can leave the blood and enter tissue fluids and they play a role in protecting mucosal surfaces. For example, the intestinal tract and the lungs. We have IgE, which is an antibody associated with allergic responses and or parasitic infections. And then we have IgD, which is an antibody where their function is unknown. Um, so as far as cell mediated immunity, this is controlled by T cells and they do not depend on antibodies. Involves the activation of phagocytes, antigen specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and the release of various cytokines, which is a protein responsible for cell signaling, okay, in response to an antigen. So the cell mediated immunity, so they respond to the antigen 
um, by activating phago phagocytes, um, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, and um, various cytokines, which are uh, which will sell signal. So how do we get immunity? The way that we get immunity, um, you can get it passively or actively. Passive immunity is the animal receives um, preformed antibodies. Okay, so the antibodies are given to this animal. Antibodies produced by a mother that are passed to the fetus transplacentally. So, um, so a fetus will gain antibodies from its mother transplacentally. Ingestion of the colostrum will is a form of passive immunity because that um, baby drinking the colostrum will be drinking antibody rich milk that's produced by its mother so the antigens will be um, discharged into the colostrum and the baby can get those antibodies that way or a plasma transfusion from a protected animal to a naive animal so um, you can do a plasma transfusion from one animal that has a great Immune, uh, immunity or a lot of antibodies against something and give it to another animal and they can passively get that immunity that way. Um, do not activate immune system and no memory cells are produced. So passive immunity is great in that you can get it passively without really doing much um, or even being exposed to the antigen at all but it doesn't act it doesn't activate your immune system and it no memory cells are produced so even though you may have immunity to it it will only last so long and it'll only bring you so far as far but the opposite of passive immunity would be active immunity so this is exposure to an antigen that triggers the animal's own immune response remember passive immunity does not trigger that animal's immune response the antigens are just kind of given to them passively so this active immunity you're actually exposed to the antigen and the animal's own immune system has to respond so memory t or b cells are produced so those memory cells are produced which is good because the next time you're going to be exposed to that antigen you're going to have those memory cells that are going to be there ready to fight it. Um, immunization is a form of active immunity, so activates the animal's own immune system. Vaccines contain um, the epitope, which is the specific piece of the antigen that an antibody binds to um, of the antigen. So two types of vaccines. Um, there's a modified live vaccine and then there's a killed, uh, killed vaccine. So the modified live has virus-like particles that have been altered or weakened to make them non-pathogenic, but still recognized as an antigen. So that means that the virus is, is non-pathogenic. It's not actually going to cause the disease, but your body still recognizes it as an invader, and it is still, it's going to stimulate that immune system to respond to that invader and create antibodies. Or there's killed vaccines, which contain virus particles that have been treated or rendered to be completely inactive active, um, so non-disease causing, but the immune system still recognizes the remnants of the virus and will respond and create antibodies.